Christine Lagarde, direktorica mednarodnega denarnega sklada, na vprašanje, ali jo kaj teži trpljenje grških državljanov. Ne. Pomislim na majhne otroke iz šola v majhni vasici v Nigru, ki so deležni dveh ur po uka na dan, ki si po trije delijo en stov in ki si srčno želijo izobrazve. Ne prestano mislim na njih, ker menim, da potrebujejo še več pomoči kot ljudje v Atenah. In kako naj se grki poberejo iz krize? Tako, da plačajo davke. Kaj pa, volitve? Nekdo je nekoč rekel, da če ljudstvo ni zadovoljno z vlado, je treba pač zamenjati ljudstvo. 16. letnik delovsko pankarske univerze. Letošnja tema – dvojna kriza evrointegracij. balanced towards the rest of the world is almost balanced. 
Now it is even slightly positive. If you look at the ratio of the public debt over GDP, well, it is not really, uh, really a serious problem. It is almost at the same level than the US. It is much lower than Japan. Uh, if you account in the UK uh, public uh, debt, also the expenditure to sustain <coughs> bank and finance, the UK will be well over the, uh, the Europe. So there is no real and external pro problem for the Eurozone, nor there should be a, a, a sovereign crisis in the, in the Eurozone. <coughs> Many people think that the crisis in Europe is uh, the fault of the Euro, of the single currency. I actually was an early critic of the project of the single currency since the early, uh, early 90s, since the Maastricht Treaty. I think uh, a thing, it, there should have been something very different from the Euro, but I do not think that this crisis is the fault of the Euro. Though it is true that the fault institutional design of the European uh, single currency is making things much, much worse. Uh, other authors, sometimes the same authors, say that the European crisis is due to the neo-mercantilist policies of a part of Europe, let us say the center north of Europe, Germany and its satellites. For satellites, I mean Belgium, Netherlands, Austria, uh, I mean Switzerland, I mean Finland, I mean even uh, Sweden which is out of the, out of the Euro as, uh, as Switzerland. Uh, this is the area who exports more than it imports and a lot of these net exports are towards the southern Europe. Uh, so this author says it is a problem of core periphery and this is the reason of the European crisis and this European crisis. Again, I was one who insisted that the neo-mercantilism is a problem in Europe, but again I do not think that this crisis, the crisis of the Euro and the, of the Eurozone is strictly speaking uh, immediately due to neo-mercantilism and this break, this fracture between the center northern Europe and the southern, uh, and the southern Europe. Other people think that this is a sovereign crisis, a public debt crisis, but as I told you before, the data uh, are actually not supporting this, so we have to understand how a sovereign crisis be be began in Europe. I will treat some of these, uh, most of these uh, topics and I will try then to ask if there is a way, a way out. When the crisis started in 2007, there were people uh, talking of a Keynes moment, a Marx moment, other people talked about a Minsky moment. Minsky was an economist that they knew personally of a very uh, radical Keynesian orientation and he died in 96. It is important because he, he thought that capitalism uh, is, uh, is always standing towards financial crisis because when accumulation goes on positively, there are bubbles. Uh, the, the positive periods create uh, euphoria. When there is the euphoria, there are bubbles. At a certain point, these financial bubbles, which are due to too much debt, too much private debt, they explode, hmm? as it happened in the 30s of the, of the last uh, century. Uh, there was a, a, an editorialist of the Financial Times, uh, John Authors, who already at the end of July 2007 said, but this may be a wild E. Coyote moment, actually, that is the... <coughs> Uh, world economy was running, as you know, well, uh, Ikoyoti does following in the 
time we called him Beep Beep. Uh, I don't know what is the, 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 the original name for the bird who is running, uh, running away. And he runs and runs at a certain point, he runs over the cliff and he continues running without any problems as the world economy did during the 2000 and part of the 90s until uh, while the coyote looks down and then there are the gravity lessons and it's, as it happened with the subprime crisis. What is the nature of the global crisis? The interpretation of the radical right is that it is the fault of the state, which is predatory. Uh, the center, center left says, oh, it is just a problem of regulation. There is not enough regulation. Most of the left uh, thinks of the crisis under an under-consumptionist view. The problem is uh, inequality, low wages, which creates a problem of effective demand which exploded uh, with this great recession. Uh, Marxists, the true orthodox Marxists, say that this is a crisis due to the falling rate of, uh, of profit. Others say, well, it is a crisis of too much finance. Sometimes do have, you have the interpretation of financialization linked to the falling rate of profit. Some other times you have it linked to the underconsumption. <coughs> I'm not uh, a guy of the radical right. I am not of the center left. But I don't think that the underconsumption is or falling rate of profit or financialization narratives are very, very good. Uh, they seem to imply that the so-called neoliberalism has been a, a feeble uh, economy since, uh, since the 80s. I don't think so. I think that for a lot of parts in the world, the so-called neoliberalism has been a, a very uh, dynamic uh, uh, economy. This was not true anymore for Japan and Europe after the 90s, but this must be, uh, must be explained. And you can't explain it with under consumption of falling rate of profit, because actually the rate of profit recovered after the 80. Low wages were there since uh, the, the Thatcher Revolution. So you can explain this crisis with phenomena uh, which either do not exist or were there uh, too, 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 too long uh, ago. Financialization is too generic uh, a term and an analysis. At this point, usually the left starts uh, asking if it is a crisis within capitalism or if it is a crisis of capitalism. What we may ask is if we really needed a new economic crisis. When I mean a new economic crisis, I, I, I mean a new big, large crisis, because I think that this is a big crisis, which is one of those many crises punctuating the history of capitalism. So these crises are not just a conjunctural phenomenon. They are really the end of a type of capitalism. They are not the end of capitalism, but they are the end of specific forms of uh, capitalism. There have been other big crises. Uh, there has been the long depression of the late 19th century that they would interpret uh, as a falling rate of profit uh, crisis in the Marxian fashion. There has been the great crash of the 30s, which I would uh, interpret as a realization crisis, a crisis of not enough effective demand, demand following uh, Marx, but also Keynes or Kalecki. There has been the great stagflation crisis of the 70s. Actually, maybe it began a few years before, which has been due uh, also or even mainly to social conflict, there is this great recession, which is another big crisis. As I told you, it started in 2007, the period going to the subprime crisis to Lehman Brothers. Then uh, there were the six months of real terror in the world economy since Lehman Brothers to March, April 2009. Unfortunately, this great terror uh, didn't last enough because there were the so-called green 
shoots of recovery and uh, after that the capitalist uh, elites and govern governments thought that they were out of the big problem so they stopped that kind of uh, Keynesian solutions which they, 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 they started to use uh, during the, the period of the, of the Great uh, Terror. Uh, I must confess that, the, however, the, the state that actually did a true Keynesian economic policy during the Great Recession has not been uh, Europe, even though Germany did Keynesian economic policies at the time. And, uh, uh, it has not been even though there was a lot of rhetoric Obama, it has been China. China, during the six months of terrors, did a very, very huge uh, public expenditure in, uh, in deficits with infrastructural, uh, infrastructural investments. Crisis came to Europe in 2010, starting from Greece. In 2011, the domino effects uh, hit uh, uh, Italy, and so we are here with the European crisis. If we want to understand, however, which kind of crisis is this, we have to understand which kind of capitalism is in crisis. And this capitalism is the so-called neoliberalism. The neoliberalism, uh, beginning with Reagan, you see him in the photo. Uh, there is also Volcker, who in the photo was the uh, governor of the Federal Reserve in 79, he made the shift in economic policy from Keynesianism to, uh, to monetarism. Of course, in those years also Thatcher made, made, uh, made the shift in uh, economic policy. Uh, what is neoliberalism, however? We all use this term, but I think that we don't understand this term. The Volcker shock. 79, 82 was based on monetarism. Monetarism was the idea that the problem is inflation and you fight inflation uh, reducing money supply. If you reduce money supply, you also uh, hit the trade unions. So you also reduce the wage uh, inflation. This was done for three years. And for three years, they, uh, they had the wages going down, so the reduction of the consumption of workers. You had very, very high interest rates, not only in nominal terms, but also in real terms. Real terms means nominal minus inflation. So actually the, uh, the investment went down. You had the beginning of, of, of an attempt to reduce the public expenditure, even though more and more the public debt exploded because the interest rate on public debt uh, went up. So, you know, in this world you had not uh, the, the, uh, the demand coming from government enough. You had not investment. You had not consumption from, for, from workers. As a world, as the world, as the planet, you cannot export somewhere else on the moon. So, you have, you have no effective demand from net exports. So the real problem is why there was not a big crash for effective demand in 82. And actually, we were almost there. There was a tendency to stagnation. The tendency to stagnation was uh, opposed by two very big, great Keynesians. Their names are Ronald Reagan and Alan Brisbane. Ronald Reagan. Uh, first, they had to stop in 82 because the crisis uh, was hitting Latin America. And Latin America was very hugely indebted with the U.S. banks. So if you let Latin America fail, uh, there is the, 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 the collapse also of the uh, American uh, banking system. And they didn't want this. Actually, the second Reagan was uh, a kind of weaponized Keynesianism. I take the, 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 the label from Paul Krugman. So actually, in the second mandate of Reagan, you had the so-called twin deficits. The deficit of the, of the fiscal uh, state, that is, uh, uh, the state uh, spent more than, uh, than what it gets from taxes, 
of course, in weapons, uh, uh, etc. But the United States be, be, be became the uh, importer, the net importer from the rest of the world. This is true of all the Anglo-Saxon capitalism, with the exception of Canada, but it was really, really huge for the US. So the US were starting to resolve the effect of demand internally, through weaponized Keynesianism, but also uh, for the rest of the world. There were countries like Japan, like East Asia, like, uh, like part of Europe, who were uh, exporting in Anglo-Saxon uh, capitalism. But then, if, if you ask who is uh, the uh, president of the United States who may explode the public debt, you have two names. The first is Reagan, and the second is George Bush Union. Then you had Greenspan. Greenspan became in 87 uh, the governor of the Federal Reserve. He is even more conservative than, uh, than Reagan is more conservative ideologically than Friedman, the monetarist Pope, uh, or even o. Hayek. O. Hayek. He, is, uh, he was a follower of a woman very radically right and libertarian, Ayn Rand. Uh, but when he became uh, the, the governor of the, United, of, of the Federal Reserve, there was a huge crisis in 1987, a huge stock exchange crisis, the most serious after 29. And what he did? He did what the Keynesians would have said. He gave a lot of liquidity to the market. And he continued to do so in every crisis. So the stock exchange started to know that, he, yes, in speculation you can win, you can lose. But if things become really, really serious, you have the central bank on your side avoiding that there is too big a collapse of the prices of stocks. So since the 87, and until actually with exceptions, but the trend was that, until 2007, you had what uh, Jan Toporowski, that I think you know because he was here many times, a capital market inflation. That is, an inflation of the prices of financial assets, stocks, but then also houses which became uh, financial assets. So we start to understand the mechanism which was built in Anglo-Saxon capitalism. Thanks to Volcker, but also thanks to Reagan, Thatcher, Greenspan, etc., workers were traumatized in the labor market and in the labor process. The term traumatized workers, by the way, is not mine, is of Reagan, of Greenspan himself. This should create problems on, this, on the side of effective demand. But there were these two other phenomena. The households, even the middle classes, households and even the, the poor households were more and more absorbed in a subordinated way to finance the stock exchange through mutual funds, through pension funds, uh, through subprime, to, to bank indebtedness. So this kind of savers, so to speak, the households, went into a kind of manic phase they thought that their wealth was going up. It was just virtual, virtual wealth. At the same time, uh, thanks to the access to debt, these families, these households could uh, um, spend without having actually income. So they were in a manic phase. I write manic depressive savers because when there is the big crisis, these households are forced to go out of the debt. So like in the bipolar psychological uh, phenomenon, they have to go out of, uh, of debt. So at certain point, that that's wrong, it's not indebted Keynesianism, these households can go into indebted consumption. Right? They can consume more because banks give them uh, credit and banks give them credit uh, on the collateral of the stocks going up or the houses going, going up. So these were the three figures explaining the model. Yes, traumatized workers, but also many savers, which became, who became indebted consumers. And all this process was politically induced by economic policy, not the usual Keynesian economic policy 
pushing up the, uh, in the, the public expenditure. Economic policy of the central bank uh, who fueled irrational exuberance. I mean, Greenspan helped this capital market uh, inflation. So we had an explosion of private debt. This was the idea of Minsky actually, but in the Minsky model, those who go into debt when the economy is going up in his original model, they are the firms. Fir firms become more and more in debt. This was not the story of neoliberalism. The story of neoliberalism was a story in the Anglo-Saxon world in which there were the households going more and more into, into debt. At a certain point, firms were even not indebted but creditors. Uh, so you had a wonderful story of capitalism as a dynamic uh, experience in which there was, yes, financialization, but this financialization is what I call real subsumption of labor to finance, the subordinated inclusion of households into the process, workers themselves through their investment funds, pension funds, etc., households, push for restructuring as well, so that there are granted uh, some of returns on their savings because they are scared uh, for the future. So what happens is that this real subsumption of labor to finance ends up pushing for restructuring in, uh, in working places. And this creates a new situation relative to Marx. Marx thought that in capitalism there is centralization and concentration, meaning the concentration of ownership, but also the concentration of workers in bigger and bigger factories. No, we had the concentration of ownership, centralization, but not anymore the big for this factory. Of course, you didn't came back, you didn't go back to the, to the small, medium factory. You had a new kind of capital based on the network firms. And it was a very dynamic process, but it exploded. It exploded uh, with the crisis of 2000 and of 2007. Here I go very quickly. Uh, this, I said that Minsky had a different idea in his books about this, this uh, private indebtedness. But actually after his last book of 86, he started to understand what was going on. You have to, to understand that these processes were created during the high 80s. So uh, he started to, in his papers, to see what was going on. He called this new capitalism money manager capitalism because households gives their uh, savings to the money managers. Uh, I say that like Toporowski says, this money manager capitalism creates capital asset inflation. I insist that this is a real subsumption to, to finance, a subordinate incorporation of families into finance, which press for continuous restructuring. This creates, of course, the fragmentation of labor, the casualization of, uh, of labor. This process is a process which needs to, which pushes for the exploitation of workers, more exploitation in production, but this exploitation must be realized on the market. How? thanks to this consumption, uh, in-depth consumption, which is driven by asset bubbles sustained by a new monetary policy. Uh, the first round of the crisis, I told you, was the dot-com crash. The second round was the subprime bubble, which was anticipated by the housing crash in 2005. When the crisis breaks up, there is the phase so-called of debt deflation, also because not only households, but also firms must go out of debt. When they do this, they reduce demand. The same happens with the states when they start austerity policies. They want to go out of their debt. They are reducing uh, the, the demand they give to the economy. But this is a paradoxical process. Why? Because everybody reduces demand, so there is less production. If there is less production, there is less GDP, less gross domestic product. So you don't go out of debt. You go more 
into debt. And this is what is happening dramatically in Europe just now. So if you start from 2007 and look at the papers, you see that from 2007 to 2009, this cry of help of YD Coyote went up and up. But uh, there was this falling down, just a hope in 2009 that the crisis was uh, beginning to be over. But that was not true, and especially was not true for Europe. Europe is still below the level of 2008. Only Germany, I think, recovered. If you look at other countries, including Italy, they are going down. European neo-mercantilism. Uh, I told you that in Europe there are countries, Germany and the satellites, which makes profits not from indebted consumption but from net exports in trade balance reinvested abroad. When I say satellites, it is not insulting. I use this term because it was in Maastricht in '94, a big conference. There was uh, a professor, I think he was Paul de Grauwe, who is a big name uh, in this kind of monetary economics, international monetary economics, and he was in the Netherlands, he used this term, he said Germany and its satellites, then he realized where he was, because he was in Maastricht, Maastricht is in the Netherlands, so he stopped and said, satellites, it's not an insult, it's a technical term. Uh, this story is the story of Germany since the late 40s, but especially since the 60s, to maintain and as surplus relative to the, to, to the rest of the world. This is going on except for China. Uh, but this is uh, maintained also inducing a reduced growth in income and employment so that wages do not go up and risk uh, a loss of competitiveness. This model, as I told you, is very diffuse. The export goes to so southern Europe a lot. They went to Russia and Latin America, but in, in the 2000s it was not possible because Russia was in crisis. Latin America has been hit, hit by, the, by, by the crisis. And so uh, the United States became actually in the 2000s the only, only uh, buyer together with uh, India and especially China for machines, from high quality machines from, uh, from Germany. And in a sense, part of Italy is a sub uh, furniture of uh, the, the, the good part, say, the advanced part of, uh, of the Italian productive structure is linked to Germany and the northern, uh, northern Europe. So this world, including Germany, has a permanent deficit towards China and uh, was uh, linked to the crucial role of the US as a buyer of last resort. Uh, this means that this gives you a, an, an idea of this division of the world that I told you. This is in 2002-2007. If you look uh, on the left, you have the Euro area economies. You see that half of it are net exported on your right, and half of it on the left are net importers. And you see Portugal, Greece, Slovakia. Spain, SVN, I think it's zero, Slovenia, Italy, and even France. Then you have the net exporters, Austria, Belgium, Germany, Finland. Uh, this is relative to the GDP, of course. Uh, Netherlands and Luxembourg. On the right, you have a similar division for the world. You have the net exporters outside the euro. You have Norway, uh, I think this Switzerland, uh, Sweden, Chile, Japan, then should be Denmark, Korea, India. Then you start with the net importers, Mexico, Great Britain, Poland, Turkey, Czechoslovakia, US, Australia, New Zealand, Hungary, and, uh, and uh, Iceland. You see all the Anglo-Saxon economies, except Canada, who is slightly on the right. It is not a 
as the, as the other one. The euro, a faulty institutional design, yes, of course, it, the euro was built on the idea that you force a nominal convergence on different uh, economies and they will converge. What happened was the opposite. There was a real divergence in, uh, in Europe. Because everybody knew, everybody sensible knew, that if you create a monetary union, you need to have budget transfers from the advanced areas to the others. Uh, you need industrial policy so that you push the backward regions uh, to a catch up of the advanced uh, economies. Uh, you need a true central bank financing governments. These are not in the Maastricht Treaty. These are not uh, in the uh, institutional design of the euro. I thought in the 90s, as other economies, that rather than a single currency, it would have been much better to have a common currency. The ideal model is more or less linked to the 1944 Keynes project at Bretton Woods. The idea is to have, in this case not for the world but the European area, uh, a currency for the central banks of Europe with fixed but adjust adjustable exchange rates within the, the, the area. So there is flexibility in this, uh, in this world and there should be a push for symmetrical adjustment, meaning that the countries which goes into surplus should be induced, otherwise they should be sanctioned, to expand more. If they expand more, they import more from the other European countries so that the, the deficits are lesser and lesser for the, for the deficit countries. Of course, there may be structural uh, problems, then you may have punctual uh, devaluation and you need to have structural uh, economic policies, but in an expanding uh, economy. This was not uh, uh, done, and we went into the euro. There is something that, is, that has to be explained. I don't know if it is in the, in the other slides. What is to be explained is that after the euro was created, it was not an immediate failure. I would have bet on an immediate failure. I would have bet that there would have been a spread uh, like we saw in the last few years, already after 1999 or 2002. No, for many years in Europe, Euro, the Euro seemed a success. And so this has to be uh, explained. One explanation is that actually the markets, the so-called markets, start to think that everybody was as good as German as debtors, so a similar phenomenon uh, to this subprime was going on in Europe. Everybody gave money to, uh, to the periphery. This meant also that there were capital exports, as it should be, from the advanced area, Germany, France, the UK, who is, who is out, to Greece, Portugal, etc. And uh, if you go and look, you see what? You see that these, these uh, countries grew up much more than Germany. Greece, even Portugal, I think, but for sure Greece, etc. The, uh, the periphery went, went much better. Ireland and Spain were growing incredibly. They had a kind of Anglo-Saxon model because they had the housing uh, bubble. They had wonderful uh, fiscal uh, situation because they had a uh, housing bubble, uh, internal demand, then high GDP, then they were very good on the Maastricht, uh, Maastricht uh, criteria. Uh, before, yes, before the crisis, there was a problem. The neo-mercantilist fracture. There were trade imbalances, but nobody complained about that. Certainly not Germany, nor the satellites. Even the fiscal position was not really felt as a, a, a problem. Ireland and Spain, as I told you, were, were a model. 
but even Italy. Italy has been, since a long time ago, a country which had low deficits. The problem of Italy is the debt, the accumulated debt, not the deficits of the 2000. Even during the crisis, we were incredibly virtuous, if you take it as, as, uh, as virtue. Yes, this is what I told you before. The fall of the country risk created a kind of supreme effect in Europe, uh, but also the possibility for, for profits for uh, French banks, German banks, uh, etc. Um, this gives you an idea before the crisis of Germany going more and more in, uh, in surplus as a net uh, exporter. You see that the euro area is more or less balanced. You see that all the others of the southern Europe are below. Also, Ireland is below. Even France is, uh, is, uh, is below. Uh, yes, this is a nice uh, thing that has been written on a Greek, uh, on a Greek uh, wall. How crisis came to Europe? Through many channels. I don't go into the detail, otherwise I will not. And uh, ever. there were the depressed expectations because Europe as a whole was not growing very, very much. There was the mortgage and financial crisis in the UK, as it happened uh, in Ireland and Spain, the deflating of the housing bubbles. So UK, Ireland and Spain started to give less demand to the other European uh, countries. Uh, then there was this fact that during the period 2007, mid-2007, mid-2008, people said, oh, don't worry, it is a US crisis. Europe has had the delinking. We are now exporting towards the BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China. With my friend Joseph Alevi, we built a caricature in the land late 2007 to say this is completely crazy because we have U.S. with a collapse in demand. So the exports of China towards the U.S. are going down. So China demands less machines and the less high quality uh, consumption goods from Germany. So there is a fall in, uh, in the exports of Germany. So there is also a fall in the demand of Germany to the sub-furniture uh, to the European things. Why I, I, I concentrate in this caricature on Germany and Italy? Because between 2007 and mid-2008, Germany and Italy were out of the crisis. They were going relatively well. Remember that even though everybody says that Italy is uh, uh, is the sick man of Europe. Italy is the second exporter of manufacturing after Germany in Europe. I will say a few things, a few things later. Then there was the problem of Greece, uh, but the crisis is not due to Greece. What matters is the central bank willingness to refinance the, the public debt directly or indirectly. This could have happened with Greece, but with every other country take a smaller euro only with Germany and, its, and the satellites. If you have an European Central Bank thinking like uh, it does, uh, the crisis could have started in the Netherlands. No, not in the Netherlands. In, yes, in Belgium, in Belgium. I'm making the error that, that Jan Dobrowski did in, a, <laughs> in a Paris. He wrote Netherlands instead of, of Belgium. But it's true, Belgium had 100% of, of, of the public debt. So if there is not this refinancing, it is not due to the trade imbalances. The trade imbalances are very, very, very serious. If you don't have trade transfers, if you don't have uh, the possibility of industrial policies, etc., you have that the country or the area which has net exports is becoming richer and richer. And those who are net importers are becoming poorer and poorer. This happened for a long time in many monetary unions. Let us say the monetary union dollar in the US. It happened uh, for a while after 
the, the war of secession, secession war. It happened in Italy after the monetary union, Lira after the 60s. So this, this happened again and again if you don't have policies in that. But it is a not a reason for the explosion of the euro, simply because it is like in the monetary union lira, the fact that, uh, let us say, let us do a, a caricature in reverse. Sicily, big net exporter. Lombardy, big net importer. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lombardy does services which are sold inside this monetary union lira, and they are very appreciated by, by the Sicilians. Should somebody care? No. In fact, in Italy, if you ask, as in the US, nobody knows what is the trade balance of Lombardy and of Sicily. In the US, you must be an expert to know what is the trade, trade balance of uh, Massachusetts, Florida, uh, Florida, etc. They go into the balances of the central bank, and it is happening in Europe through the so-called target two things. I'm not saying that trading balances are not a serious problem. They are a big problem for the real economy and for the impoverishing of part of, uh, of, 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 of that world. But they are not the reason for the crisis of the, of the euro. Fiscal austerity, as I, as I told you, became the, 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 the world of the game in Europe, but these policies are self-defeating for, the reason, for the reasons I said. They, they depress the GDP once goes more and more into debt deflation. Uh, rating agencies after 2007, as before, has been said, oh, they are the guilty ones because they started to downgrade different countries. But this thing, in this case, they were absolutely right. They, what they, they saw were politicians which were not able to create growth. Certainly they have their fancy and strange idea of how growth is created. But with the policies in Europe, growth was not there. So you had the GDP, which was not going, going up. You had this division of Europe, of the different areas. At a certain point, there was an explosion of the rate of interest in the periphery relative to the, to the core. So what, what, is, what was going to happen is that the people more and more indebted could become insolvent. Because even when you are illiquid, you cannot pay your, your debt. Yes, in principle, if you survive until the end, you may be solvent. But that's not true, because if the, if the rate of interest goes up and up, and the GDP goes, goes down, you are dead. And the markets do this game, that if you are dead in two years, I take you as dead just now. So. What happened was that the crisis in Greece, a tiny segment of the budget uh, of, the, um, of the markets for, uh, for state bonds, for government bonds, was really, really tiny. You could have condoned all that to the Greek guys. It would have been a problem because, yes, there was the, the banks uh, connected, you know, but it could, it could have been managed. It was not done. It was done the austerity game against Greece. So Greece went more and more into debt. Then the domino effect went to Ireland. Then went to Portugal. Yes, now we are, I think, at 7% of the, of, of the market for the state, state bonds. People expected Spain and after a while Italy. When the domino effect hit Spain in the mid-2011, immediately it, Italy. Why? Because of what we just said. Italy was with a growth rate of zero. It was virtuous on the public deficits, but it had a public debt of 120%. You don't need to have a master or a a PhD in economics to understand that with the rate of interest of 7%, the stock of the debt becomes crucial. So they start to think, well, these guys in two years are dead. And if things go on in this way, it's better to go away. And what happened in Europe is that because the European Central Bank started to, to, to treat the euro of the 
degrees as different from the euro of Spain or the euro of Italy or of the euro of Germany that savers and speculators started to do the same and they moved their money from the banking and financial system of the periphery to the core and to Germany. So Germany now is uh, going into debt with ridiculous interest rates of less than 2,000% and probably less than the true inflation, while the others are, are dying. Why? Because the markets for a long while have been betting the explosion of the euro. So at that point, Greece, Spain, Italy will have to, uh, to pay their debt in a devalued currency. It's better to be in the good part of the present euro than in, in the part which will, 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 which will have to go out. This game was killed with words more than action by Mario Draghi uh, at the middle of 2012, between July and September. Maybe, maybe that Italy now will <laughs> create again that kind of game. But here is, uh, is the point, the last one. Uh, the fault of the left in my view has been to think that the Euro technocrats never change. Actually until now I have talked as, as me too as if this is true. But if you look from now, no, if you put yourself in 2007 or even mid 2008, and uh, say, oh, in the future, European technocrats, European Central Bank, will act as they acted in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. You would not believe that, because they have done a lot of institutional innovation. They, they have started to give credit to the banks against assets which were more and more worthless, then even against uh, public debt uh, assets, then they even started to act not only as a, a finance, a, as a lender of last resort to the banking system, but also to the governments. They did that on the secondary market. And the last move by Mario Draghi is, well, we may think of doing that in certain cases, also directly on the primary market. So my bet is that they are really, really willing to maintain the euro. And they do, I, here I quote Mario Draghi, whatever it takes to do that. So actually, what is my bet on the future is that actually we are in this strange situation, that the euro as it is, is going towards a kind of blind alley. That the present policies are policies of stagnation. But this does not mean an immediate explosion. This means to maintain the euro on this path. Why? Because I think people like Draghi wants to build even partially against some German interests, a true European capital with a true European political subject. My understanding of the left is that the left is still reasoning at another level, at the national level. If you stay at the national level, either as capital or as left, you just have to understand that the end of the path is the explosion of the euro. Mm -hmm. So if you are on that path, you should work for what is called by somebody a plan B. Let us go out of the euro. Let us go do that now. Possibly, if you are on the left, with some, some, uh, some ways to defend uh, the workers 
workers' income and, uh, and so on. I fear that going out of the euro now is not a game. It's not a game because it is not just like the lira who went out of the European monetary system in the 92. By the way, that experience was awful for workers. But this time would be much worse because we are in the middle of a world crisis and against a, a, a strong European capitalist project. My, my, my perception is that actually if we go out of the euro, what we will have will not be a, a regain, a, a gain, having again monetary uh, autonomy uh, used for social interest. I would bet for more austerity policies, not for less austerity policies. So actually, I think that the way out is not the fault, the way out is not the exit of the euro. Uh, there should be a way out linked to struggles and political actions on a European wide, uh, wide level for the left. We all know that a way out should be, could be either growth or inflation, but they are not possible now. Uh, this is a thing that was, uh, was created by Occupy Wall Street in New York. You know? The light at the end of the tunnel has been turned off. But the Americans have this other expression. expression. Light at the end of the tunnel may be a night velocity train, a déjà vu or an Amtrak going on in your direction. So, and I fear the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't go on this I, because I think I, I spoke almost an hour. I want to say just a few things of, on Italy. Why Italy is, uh, is seen as the sick man of Europe? The reasons usually are four. One is the public finance. The second is uh, the income for citizens and the productivity for each worker. The third one is that we have uh, a, a kind of huge deindustrialization, meaning the almost disappearance of the big industries and the crisis of the industrial districts. The fourth is that uh, we have less, we are less and less competitive in Europe, if you look at the wage for unit labor costs. These things are true, but I want just to be provocative uh, saying that, yes, the public debt. The public debt, I, I already told you, so I can be very quick here. We have been virtuous on the deficit. Our problem is the inherited uh, debt stock. But for sure, our crisis, this crisis, is not due to the deficit. We have done more than enough uh, on, that, uh, on that level. And actually, in Italy, as elsewhere, the problem of the public debt is the fault of neoliberalism, not of the preceding era of Keynesianism. If we look at the income for citizens and the productivity for each worker, we see that they are stagnating. Actually, since uh, almost 20, 20, uh, 20 years. This, of course, is linked to the end of the big firms. But we have to say two things here, and also those I anticipated. There is the fact that the European, the Italian manufacturing is the second exporter in Europe. So you have to put these two things, uh, these two things uh, together. And this is linked to the issue of the end of the industrial sector in Italy. Yes, the big firms are disappearing. Only Fiat is there, it's not doing very well in the European market. 
and yes, the industri traditional industrial districts are in crisis. But Italy has been good in creating the so-called pocket multinationals. They are called by somebody Ford Capitalism. They are small and medium enterprises which are able to have net exports and even investments abroad. Mm -hmm. So what is the problem of Italy here? The problem of Italy here is that you have a very divided Italy in which there are sectors who are stagnating and sectors which are actually very advanced. And the real problem of Italy is that uh, um, this model of the four capitalism, like the model of the industrial district, cannot be a model for an advanced country, for a country as a whole. It can be good for specific areas, but it cannot be the model to extend all over, all over, all over Italy. If you look at uh, areas like the like China, or even Europe, or even Germany, you see that they have a kind of coherent matrix of, uh, uh, of firms hmm? in every, every level. Huh? Italy now is just betting on, uh, on few small and medium enterprises, and that's not the way you can have a thriving, a thriving industry. Yes, we have banking problems, but they are not linked to this crisis. They are linked to liberalization and privatization of the 90s, and it's not linked, they are not linked with this crisis for a very simple reason, because our banking system was relatively backward. That's what they said us during the 2000s. Being backward, we were not in the situation of even French and German banks who went into the crisis with the subprime crisis. We, we had not so much exposure to the toxic, uh, to the toxic, uh, to the toxic assets. The last point, but I don't want to go into into that, is this: I, I think that Italy is a serious problem of the composition of output, which kind of products we 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 we, we produce. But it is not a backward uh, countries. It has its areas of uh, vitality. But if you want to ask when Italy started to have these problems, actually it has not to do with this crisis. It has not even to do with neoliberalism. The, 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 the problem in Italy started in the mid 60s. In the mid 60s, the European bourgeoisie did not answer in a progressive way to the first social struggles of the early 60s. And so they stopped investing for a while. And uh, that's that there was this game which started and never stopped of having sectors and industries disappearing. This is not pathological. In every uh, economy, there are sectors and firms which disappear, and other sectors and firms which come into. This did happen. When there was the liberalization, all the big firms were given to the private, uh, private capitalists who went into the monopolies of the old state firms to get rents. And the only private economy, a private firm, big firm, Fiat, went into disastrous, uh, disastrous choices because they were more interested in finance. But this story is a story which goes back to the 60s. So if we want to understand the crisis uh, of Italy, we have to go back. Why I say Italy is a paradigmatic uh, exception? I think it is a paradigmatic exception because uh, the contemporary capitalism is based on this perverse mixture of rent and profit, finance and industry. From this point of view, Italy is the same. It was able, during the so-called Italian miracle, to play this game in an expansive way, but after, after uh, the, 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 the 60s, more and more, 
the Italian economy is showing the rest of the world what, what is the meaning of having a, uh, an economy based uh, in which profits are based on rent and, and, uh, and finance. I stop here because I think I don't, I don't more than an hour. And it's, it's enough. Thank you very much for an excellent lecture. I don't think we should have any difficulties continuing the debate. The floor is open. Comments, questions? If people is interested, I have with my partner, Giovanna Verto, my Facebook page where we publish our stuff, Italians, but also in English. It's called Economist in Class. It's, uh, Dual meaning, I hope you get it. <laughs> Europe was in crisis 
Well, before, before summer, almost in, in, that, in that period, the crisis hit Germany. And Germans, for a while, even Angela Merkel, looked as a Keynesian. They said, oh, there must be demand. They didn't do like Italy. The Berlusconi government in that period, Berlusconi has always been against the, this uh, European Central Bank idea, the Stability Pact, but in the last few years of his last government, he was forced to be more serious. And this was done by his Ministry of the Treasury, Tremonti, who decided to cut everything or horizontally, no, to each each part of the state should spend no more than five percent. It's not a great great idea. And uh, what the Italians did was uh, captured by a phrase of an Italian uh, Neapolitan uh, writer of theater, Eduardo De Filippo, "Ada passa annuttata," which means the night should pass. Huh? Let us hope that somehow, somewhere, there will be a new, a new demand. Germany and France didn't do this way. They actually uh, spent. And Germany did even intelligent things like the, 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 the short week. Huh? They didn't let firms fail or workers be, be expelled. And you see this in their deficits. And there were deficits not because the GDP went down, also if we had this kind of GDP. If GDP goes down, you have to pay more subsidies, you have less taxes. No, no, no. In the case of Germany and France, they are a bit different in policies they did. But in those cases, you had active policies. At a certain point, Angela Merkel and Germany changed their mind. Why? There was this idea that we were out of the peak crisis. But if you look at what happened in 2009, 2010, 2011, was the strange thing. Germany started to grow, started to run. For 20 years, they had not very high rate of growth. They started to run. And so they look at it themselves and say, oh, we are running. And we are accumulating this huge net export. And they think that the idea that you are putting forward, which I'm not saying it is wrong prospectically, they thought it was true just now. Now, the fact is that the crisis of the Southern Europe and of the austerity policy in the rest of Europe came back to them. Because if you look at the share of net export of Germany towards the, the, the net rest of Europe, is still, still, still very huge. They now can't do that. They started realizing other things, that if you are a big creditor, it's your problem. And in Europe, they are big creditors. And what happens if Euro explodes? They have the problems on the two sides. They will have huge revaluation, and they don't know actually those credits if they will actually get it. And the banks of Germany are not in a very good shape. And Germany, uh, because they have a lot of credits, and because their small and medium banks have a lot of problems. So Germany is against a true banking union with uh, inspectors going into their system. So, I, I am saying that prospectically, you may be right, and this, of course, it's a centrifugal, if this term exists in English, a force for the explosion in the future, but not right now. So we are seeing in a minor key a thing that we have seen twice in Europe. My theory is every time Germany is forced into the Euro project was forced into the Euro project, they asked for a price. In my idea, the Maastricht Treaty was a French project, not a German project. They had to sign because of unification, a, a, a lot of, 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 other, of things. But at 
that point they said, oh, oh but we want to be sure that this, those bastard Italians uh, are, uh, are in chains, so the parameters on the fiscal... Uh, this happened again when the project exploded. They resurrected after 1996. We should explain why, but don't, don't, don't go there. So they had to go again into the project because Germany in the 90s was not very, very strong. They had internal, internal problems. At, the, at this point, they asked another prize, the Amsterdam and, and Dublin Pact. What happened? That they were the one they were among the ones before the beginning of the, of the European project who were not respecting the Maastricht parameter. They were the one in the early 2000, uh, after the supply crisis, who broke the Amsterdam and Dublin pact with the French. So nicely, Mario Monti in a conference said, well, you should look at yourself. Now they start to be a bit more relaxed because the problem is huge. I'm not so sure that at the European level they now will want to implement the fiscal compact as it has been originally designed. So this is more or less about your, your first, uh, your first uh, thing. About Italy, you are quite right. Uh, the dualism is an Italian characteristic, but that has been true in my view, as I said, of the US, of Germany after the unification. The problem is the policies that are done there. Here I am a bit pro-German. I think that the reason for the strength of Germany is that they did something uh, on a structural level. So I am against the structural policies as they are put forward on the right, but, you know, they were able to create goods which are needed elsewhere. They are monopolists in advanced sectors. And that's, that's a great thing. Italy is just a dependent country, you know. As Germany is dependent from China, we are dependent from the, from, from the rest of the world. This is not a good model. But at least Germany has structural strengths. It, it's a leader in, in some point. You are also right about the role of tele, television. That was a positive role. When I was very young, there was a, 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 new, a, a, a transmission on TV, uh, Non è mai troppo tardi. I don't know if it happens to you. It was a, a teacher with, uh, of the elementary school who used new techniques and time. And he was teaching Italian to all people, to, to an alphabet, etc. The television has been fundamental. It has been a very different kind of, of television from the Berlusconi one. The Berlusconi role since the 80s has been to capture, after 68 and the 70s, the willingness of the people to be freer and to turn this on an individualistic level. He took the sexual uh, revolution and the uh, sexual liberation, turning into a kind of stupid, sexistic uh, game, you know? And, and so actually he corrupted uh, the Italian uh, the Italian soul. Any other questions? Comments? What do you foresee now uh, after the, the elections? I knew that there should have been <laughs> a question like this. It's difficult where to start. <coughs> I, I would like to start from a very theoretical thing. Then we go and apply it to it. I think I gave a different idea of what neoliberalism is. Uh, 
know, as a, as a kind of capitalism. But neoliberalism may be seen as a kind of economic policy. In my idea, in my, 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 my thinking is that since the 80s, and especially since the 90s, we have lived through two competing economic policy paradigms. One I call neoliberalism, and the other I call social liberalism. The center right and the center left. It is an ideal type, so it's, it's not perfect. But let us say Berlusconi, neoliberalism, Bersani and DPD, social liberalism. Yes, there is the radical left. There are the economists like me. We were out of the game and very, very confused politically. Now, the problem is that the way the left has, has read neoliberalism and social liberalism is stupid. When we say neoliberalism in Italy, as I fear in most countries, we think, oh, it is the return of laissez-faire. <coughs> Absolute free market uh, policies. Absolutely not. And I insisted that it was a kind of uh, paradoxical Keynesianism. Why? Now, the neoliberals like Berlusconi or Bush, they are truly for the free market, in the labor market, and on the welfare, I mean uh, precarization. And uh, let us not give money to people or uh, social assistance to people to do nothing. Huh? So they are for the free market. They are, but they are not for the free market on the goods and service sector. I don't have to give arguments. I just give names. Berlusconi and Bush, two monopolies. They, they never went into a serious competition uh, policies, and the things like the fiscal pact, the Maastricht Treaty, etc. You go and look at Clinton. He was the one who reduced the deficit in the US. They were Reagan and Bush who exploded it. Berlusconi has been always very vocal against it. Even in this, in this election, he was on the opposition from the, that point of view. So they are, they are not in favor of the, of the economic uh, or orthodoxy. Uh, take the social liberals. The social liberals are the opposite. They are much more for the free market than the neoliberals. The social liberals, like Bersani, are for uh, uh, the market as more competition. It is the culture of the antitrust. He became famous because of the so-called lensualat, the liberalization of the services, etc. They should push uh, the, the vitality of Italians up, reduce uh, the rents, the position of rent, etc. The theory is very clear. The, the capitalist wants monopolies. A true free market regulates those bad guys of the capitalists. I have friends who were once very much on the left. Now they ended as editorialists of the Brera Sera, who supported very much the pension fund reform in Italy because this way we are able to create a true stock market in Italy, which is controlled by pension funds, which may be linked to the trade unions. In this way, we can create a contendibility uh, of firms, which is what the capitalist big firms don't want. Huh? This is social liberalism at its best. Uh, they are for the free market, more for the economic orthodoxy, about Maastricht Treaty, fiscal compact, with arguments which, which are not always stupid. They say, but look what in Italy the Christian Democrats and the socialists did thanks to, to the perverse public, uh, uh, public uh, expenditure. But they are not completely for the free market. Uh, you know, in Italy, when you say social liberal, the left thinks, oh, yes, they are neoliberal, but just a bit less. No, no, no. They are people with a good heart. 
They don't want precarization. They want flexibility of workers. They don't want the, to destroy the welfare state. They want a different welfare state, and this different welfare state uh, is based, for example, it's not anymore based on work, but it's based on, it's a universal welfare state, which gives to citizens some subsidies, for example, so that we do not defend the work position, but we defend the workers. So that's not anymore. If you are laid off, laid, laid off, uh, we give you also some uh, instructions so you are flexible enough and you will find a new, a new job. This is not the bad, the bad thing. Now what happened in Italy as elsewhere, there was a new political cycle. In this way, the, the neoliberals go to the government. They, at this point, they create a general position of trade unions, social movements, the radical left with the moderate left, with the sensible Democrats, etc. They go down, and the social liberals win. The first problem. At this point, they look at the finances. There is no money there. We can do anything. So please, wait. We will give we will give you the redistribution, but later on. Now let us start with the liberalization, uh, etc. There is a division of the bloc. Uh, even the radical left has to fight the source itself, fight the social movement, who are a bit angry, etc. So this expression, this situation ends. And you have a new cycle. And you have the second Berlusconi, you have the new Prodi. My idea is that this cycle was ending because people was fed up of this kind of things. This thing in Italy has been created by a coup d'etat of the European Central Bank and of our president of the Republic. Very well intentioned. Do I love Berlusconi? No. But the way Berlusconi was put out of government in the, the, la, last year has not been very, 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 very nice. Like in uh, Greece, they said, no, no, you Greek, no referendum, no uh, election now, and they decided the prime minister. The, the same was done in Italy. in Italy. Almost the same. I am convinced that if the Democratic Party would have gone immediately to the election last year, Berlusconi would have been destroyed. They didn't want it. I didn't bet, however, on a resurrection of Berlusconi of this kind. I, I, I think that he has, however, problem to be a leader now, but for sure I underestimated his capacity to, to, to recover. I thought Monty could have, have something more, but you see, what happened was, and I was thinking that actually what would have happened was, would have been a revival of the social liberal uh, thing for a couple of years, probably. What happened is that really people was fed up, and they voted for Grillo. The, the radical left committed suicide. Suicide. They was in the assemblies at the beginning of the creation of this list, Revolution Civita. I decided personally not to vote them because they were really suicidal and insulting towards people. They put from above lists full of political people pre presenting the thing as something so, you know, they, they, they took the 2%. Two, the two but what, what happened uh, uh, about uh, people like Grillo is that he was able to collect the, uh, the criticism also and very much on the left with the more precise programs than the far left. You know, the far left only said we are against the fiscal compact. Also, also Grillo is against the fiscal compact. That, 
for that kind of thing I go with Grillo, not with the other thing. And Grillo was more precise against the euro, etc. The problem is that he's not precise very much. He's more precise, but when you go and look, <coughs> he has some very, very worrying expressions against the trade unions, uh, we are not right, not left, uh, he expresses solidarity with the neo-Nazis, etc. But he says, okay, let us have a citizen income, reddito di cittadinanza. Where do we take the money? From those bastards of the public sector. So you see, it's, it's something moving. I think that has been, that the people of, of, of my kind who said, oh, they are just a new Northern League. They didn't enter the game. We should have gone into that game, taken them seriously, discussed one propos proposition after the other, having a decent program. Otherwise, white people should uh, should should vote you. Know? What will happen now? It's uh, <laughs> it's the real issue and. Frankly, I don't know. What I, I read is that uh, Bersani does not want to go into a government with, the, with uh, Berlusconi because he would be trapped. So he proposed not an alliance, but a minority government agreeing with Grillo certain topics for a while. Uh, on the cost of politics, uh, on the defense uh, of uh, the social situations which are most deteriorated, etc. Uh, of course, he would have the same problem with Grillo. He is the, in the hands of Grillo. At the same time, in this in this way, Grillo does not go into the government because Grillo will not go the government to reduce uh, itself to, 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 to nothing. Today it seems that Grillo at first has said he some, not yes, but almost, the last news of this morning is that he said, no, 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 I will never uh, make an alliance. You know, I, either they go soon to the election, but I think that this will be actually impeded by Europe. I, I, I don't think, and I'm not sure that Grillo will, uh, I don't know, will uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll win. But if, if he wins, we, we will be in a complete chaotic situation because a lot of good ideas, absolutely no, no true democracy, uh, no true debate. So it, 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 it's, it's a, complete, uh, a complete chaos. Uh, I, uh, frankly, I fear a, a, a turn into more subtle authoritarian dimension, either from above. I, I, I don't want to, to think of something really authoritarian, but you know, I, I think that Europe may really force force much on Italy just now. Uh, so we are in what is called the deadlock. I, I don't know where, where we'll, uh, we'll go. I have no answer. OK. Uh, are there any urgent questions? Otherwise, I think uh, we can conclude at this point. Uh, of course, uh, next week we are uh, continuing with the, uh, the usual time. It's uh, 6 o'clock on Thursday, as you all know. and I'm. Uh, also obliged to invite you to uh, to buy some books in the backwards. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.